Good morning, everyone. Um, we want to respect everyone's time. The clock shows a few minutes after 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we want to welcome everyone to our monthly Coffees with the Community. Uh, my name is Dallas Ackerman. I'm our Director of Communications and Marketing in Liberty Public Schools. Um, just a great opportunity to engage with our parents, uh, community members, and uh, this has been a, a series that has now ran for um, in our fourth year, um, a chance each month to get out and talk about a district topic. Uh, over the last several years, we've addressed topics such as our digital transformation in the district, um, cyber safety, we've had a facility update, uh, had that earlier on this year with uh, uh, Mr. Steve Anderson, um, and uh, it's just been a, a great series for us to connect. And uh, today we want to thank the City of Liberty, uh, appreciate Sarah Cook and all her help with uh, getting this meeting arranged and uh, we feel it is a very good topic uh, to discuss. We're going to mix things up just a little bit this month, though, and I'm going to have our superintendent of Liberty Public Schools, uh, Dr. Jeremy Tucker, come up to the front at the podium, and then he will introduce our uh, presentation for this month. Again, thanks for coming. Um, what a timely topic as we talk about child safety, student safety. Um, and it's not a topic that we solely want to address in a, in a single event. It's an issue that we want to continue to keep at our forefront, that our highest priority within our district, within our community, and we know certainly of all of our families, is the well-being and the safety of children. And so as we talk through this morning's presentation and we share some information on a day in and day basis as to what goes on in our schools and the efforts, the initiatives that we have in place, um, as you followed the news and the media attention regarding a situation within the <coughs> Public School District, we want to tell you about the steps that are also being taken. Um, it involves a couple of things. It involves re-educating and informing our communities as to the efforts that we have in place on a daily basis, but then also some additional work that's taking place. And it really started back in the fall in conversations during the course of my transition to the district as a new superintendent and the things that I have picked up and the things that I have learned about Liberty Public Schools, both the successes as well as the challenges that we face and that it really starts with the safety and security of our kids. Add to that the engagement of our Board of Education and that our board has been very highly engaged this year along with over the course of the last couple of weeks and these issues surrounding our students' well-being specifically in developing legislative priorities and that the very first priority we identified with the Board of Education and as a school district, both for the Liberty Public School System, but then the Liberty Community, but then our broader education system across the state is the well-being of our learners. And so I wanted to share with you um, the key priority that was developed with the Board of Education and it simply states this. Knowing that children and teens come from varying backgrounds, Liberty Public Schools strive to meet the needs of our diverse learners. High expectations are embedded throughout learning opportunities and afforded to all learners as they grow in their academic pursuits. For our most challenged learners, the services are provided to assist in meeting their social, emotional, physical, and mental health needs. The Liberty Public Schools Board of Education supports the expansion of services and resources to meet the growing social, emotional, physical, and mental health needs of our learners. So where do we stand? Today we stand at a critical juncture and an opportunity to dialogue and engage parents, community members, uh, staff, administrators within our district. And we're seeing that play out in recent days in a couple of key areas. We've had in place within our district a committee that is referred to as the BEST Committee. And that's been in place for some time now. The BEST Committee stands for Building and Encouraging a Safer Tomorrow. Over the course of last year, they looked at our district and our community and identified some key issues that we face and some key challenges that we face. In that work, they came to five key areas. The first area being of mental health, as we mentioned in our legislative priorities. That issue of bullying that we face and that we have as a challenge. The issue of interpersonal and social interactions. 
the issue of personal safety, as well as the issue of substance abuse. We feel as though we can strengthen the work of that group in that we've joined recently in developing uh, an entity called the Liberty Alliance for Youth. And that was a grant that we received over the next 10 year period in being able to focus in on hone in on some of these efforts and some of these issues. And so by joining together with the best committee and circling around uh, with the team that represents the Liberty Alliance for Youth, we feel that we'll be able to move forward and really putting in place an ongoing system of accountability and oversight, not only around the issue of bullying, but around these other issues that we've identified. The second thing we look to do is to be able to engage um, our patrons and our community, our families. Uh, this evening we're meeting with our PTA presidents and opening up the conversation as to what do those engagement opportunities look like, whether it is with representation from each of our schools and parents as they work with PTA, or whether it's perhaps in settings similar to this as we continue to uh, be good stewards of resources, but certainly be able to meet the needs of our diverse learners. We want to transition over to what we do on a daily basis and give you uh, kind of some practical understanding of that. And what better way to do that than uh, present something, a program that we have targeting our, our sixth graders, and that is the LIFE program, Liberty Intervention Focusing on Education. We do a tremendous amount of work in our district around the issue of building relationships whether it's in the classroom, whether it's through our administrators, our counselors, our support staff, drivers, cooks, you name it. And we want to invite to the podium Officer Kyle Hamline, who's been very integral in connecting with kids, but then also infusing in them um, life lessons. And that is these lessons that will hopefully uh, make them successful in school, but certainly make them successful in life. So please welcome to the podium, Kyle Hamline. Well, good morning. First of all, it's a privilege to get to come and talk with you guys about the programs that I get to teach. Uh, I started, first of all, a little bit, bit about myself and what I bring to the schools and the relationships from the Liberty Police Department to the schools is I'm a police officer now almost for 20 years in the city of Liberty. I worked as a road patrol officer for seven years. I worked in the investigation unit for five years. I worked uh, with the, the, Clay, the Clay County Drug Squad for three years, and then I thought I just had enough policing. I thought I was going to get out. And then the opportunity to become a school resource officer came available. So I thought, why not? We'll try it. I get paid to go hang out with kids. Are you seriously? What the best choice I've ever made. It's by far the best position on the Liberty Police Department. Some guys say they can't deal with the kids. That's okay. I'll handle it because they are amazing. Uh, we In law enforcement, we deal with about the same probably three to 5% of the population over and over and over again. But we never get to see that 95% of the awesomeness. I get to see that. I get to see that in our schools. And as I got into the schools seven years ago, I realized, hey, it's not just the policemen in the schools. In fact, I'm just a resource in the schools. I'm a resource for the schools in a connection between the city and law, but also a resource for social, counseling, for if there needs to be discipline. I'm there to help out if it's a legal issue. But most of, most of all, it's just something, a place, a person that the kids can bounce off of, a place the principals can have their thoughts bounce off of, teachers, and parents. And I get, I get calls and emails from parents on a daily basis. Hey, I have this issue going on with my kid. What should I do? I need resources. Where can I go? And I'm just a resource and I have the connections where I can try to get those implemented and get those in place for them. And if I don't have the answer, which some answers I don't have, I'll go find the answers for them because our kids need it. They have challenges. We, we all here in this room are beyond a generation from what they have grown for, into. Technology today has definitely created a, a child a lot different than what we were even at their age. So having that knowledge of knowing what they're going through to be able to help them is great being able to be in the schools and do that and that's one of the aspects I like most about the school resource officers because I actually as a parent I get to see because I actually am in a school with my own child so my seventh grader I get to hang out with her every day which she really enjoys she comes, comes up and gives me hugs every day um, my sophomore at Liberty High School I learn and I get to see what their changes are and try to help them 
in conjunction with my life experiences, also get to help them. And hopefully there are a lot of similarities so we can help them get through their life experiences too. And then I also have one that just graduated from Liberty High School last year. And the challenges even as a graduate from Liberty High School are a lot different than when I graduated from Liberty High School back in 1986. In, as an SRO, as school resource officer, like I said, those many other tasks, but teaching is probably one of my favorite. I get to get into science classes and I get to teach them about the accident investigations that I get to do out as a police officer. I go into history classes and talk about constitutional law and their rights and what they get to, what they can expect from law enforcement and what they can do legally and their rights and respect and be responsible with those rights. Um, I get into Spanish classes, talking about law enforcement and understanding different languages and understanding. Even though I don't speak fluent Spanish, I have to understand Spanish because I do deal with a lot of Spanish speak, uh, Hispanic speaking community and we have to know, are they saying something bad? Are they saying something good? So I get to get in there and teach them a little bit about Spanish. I also get to get into the facts class, our, our family and consumer science classes. Now these are probably the most fun because these I get to give my life experiences and unfortunately for my daughters, a lot of their experiences come out in these facts classes. So the students get to go back and see my daughters and did you really do this? Did this really happen? Because I get to share those stories with them. And I was asked to come and talk about two things today. Uh, number one was stranger danger. This time of year, we have to, we have to alert our children. We, is Liberty a safe place? Absolutely. It's one of the safest communities in America, and I'm proud that I was raised here. I'm proud that my daughters are being raised here, and I hope they decide to raise my grandchildren here because it is a great community, a great school district, and a great safe place to raise your children. And so I get to teach them about stranger danger in our facts classes. Because unfortunately, just like anywhere, even as safe and as, as our community is, there are dangers. And unfortunately, as a detective, I did have to interview some of those people. And so what I did was I put together programs for our facts classes to teach about being home alone and for safe sitting. And I go in there and I talk to the kids. And it's a little bit different for middle schoolers than it is for grade schoolers. Grade schoolers, we should be telling our kids, very simple, no, go, yell and tell. Number one, a parent, an adult should not be asking you for favors. An adult should not be offering you anything. An adult shouldn't be asking you to do something. So you should always say no to any adult that's not your parents or somebody that has authority over you that you know. That comes to the stranger. Who is a stranger? We have to explain to our kids who a stranger is because strangers can be a clean cut gentleman walking down the road. A stranger can be a grandma driving up in a car. A stranger can be anybody that they do not know on a first name basis. And you've got to define that stranger to your children. You've got to give them that definition that if it's not somebody that you know, somebody that I have introduced you to, somebody that we have had at our house, that is a stranger. And they should have no go, yell and tell if they're confronted by a stranger. Now the, the go, that's many things. At a young age, it's teach them to run. Teach them to get away as fast as you can. But at the middle school, we don't teach them just to go run away. We want them to get away, but we start teaching them, it's time to, you can defend yourself. It's okay. It's okay to, to defend yourself. It's okay if you have a weapon. It's okay. Now, do we want our kids carrying guns in the city of Liberty? Absolutely not. In fact, that's the first thing I tell them. This does not mean go home and tell mom and dad that you need a gun. What it means is, to think of the little weapons that you do have. Like for instance, I tell them the story when I was a young boy. I was walking home with my friend and it was late night, we were going to go spend the night and somebody jumped out of the bushes. And I did what I normally do every day because I lived on a gravel road. I leaned down, I picked up a rock, I chucked it and we ran. We ran all the way to his house and what we found about 30 minutes later as we ran in we told his mom and dad, mom, dad, there's somebody out there, there's somebody out there. His big brother wasn't prepared for defense. He wasn't ready for my defense and he came in with a big goose egg. I learned to use my weapon. I didn't know it was going to be a weapon, but I learned to use it. And it's okay to teach a child. It's okay to defend yourself. In fact, I, I refer to uh, every sixth grader to look up Google Brittany Baxter. Brittany Baxter is a young lady, seven years old. Bad people do not like to work. If they wanted to work for things, they'd get a 40 hour, day, 40 hour week job, they would go to work and they would buy the things that they wanted. If they wanted to get somebody and have a relationship with, 
It's hard work. I've been doing it for a little over 20 years myself, and it's hard work. You have to, you have to work. You have to buy them flowers. You have to take them to the movies. You have to, then you buy them a house, and you have to have children with them, and it's very expensive, so you have to work at it. It's hard work. And so bad people don't like it. They don't want to work. Brittany Baxter, it took her four seconds, four seconds in a Walmart. She went into a Walmart, and, had, and her dad taught her well. He taught her, no, go, yell, and tell. Perpetrator grabbed a hold of her. His intention was probably go and take her and kill her. He grabbed a hold of her, it took her four seconds to fight, scratch, kick, scream, and yell for him to drop her down. He didn't want to work. A seven-year-old girl can fight off a, 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 a full-grown man? We teach our, our, our middle schoolers, it's okay. It's okay if you're in fear. If you, somebody hurts you, somebody's going to attack you, you can defend yourself and use whatever means is necessary. In fact, my, I was just talking to my daughter here just the other day. One of the things I try to encourage is they get into eighth grade as they're getting ready to go into high school. We actually do a self-defense class with our eighth graders. And we talk about the simple things that we forget about. We forget about those stranger danger lessons we had in elementary. We forget about them in middle school. That's why even I have training lessons every month to give me back to the mindset, be prepared for anything, because anything can happen. Now, we have to have a positive attitude that more than likely it's not going to. In fact, the likelihood of me being shot as a police officer is probably about the same as me getting hit by lightning. But I still wear my vest every day. I want to be prepared. And so we tell our kids, be prepared and aware of, of your surroundings. Be ready to go. And one of the things that I taught my daughters was that weapon of choice is a golf ball, a simple golf ball. Now that golf ball, it's like a rock. If you've ever been hit with a golf ball, it hurts. And it will stop somebody. You can put it into a sock and make a very deadly weapon. You can throw it. You can put it into your fist and make your, your as my seventh grade daughter ta taught me, this is a cinnamon roll. And you can make your cinnamon roll into a strong defense mechanism. Now that golf ball, more importantly than anything, can go with you anywhere. It can go in your backpack. It can go with you on an airplane. It can go with you on a bus. It can go with you as you walk down the road. More importantly than anything, it reminds you to be aware of your surroundings. I asked my daughter just the other day, because she had that le this lesson in eighth grade, you still have your golf ball? Absolutely. In fact, there's a lip balm that is a lot like a golf ball. And sometimes in school, she'll accidentally pull out her golf ball instead of her lip balm, and everybody asks her, why do you have a golf ball? She said, I may have to use it someday, and you'll know why. <laughs> we have, the main thing is being, is communicate with our kids. Tell them that it's okay. That yell, using our voice as a weapon. Even, even as small children, it's okay to yell. If you feel uncomfortable, it's okay to yell. I asked the sixth graders, is it okay to, if somebody's walking down the road in your neighborhood and you're walking along the street on this other opposite side, is it okay to yell out to them, sir, you're making me feel uncomfortable. If you come over here, I'm going to scream, I'm going to yell, I'm going to run, I'm going to go call the police. Is it okay to do that? Most of the kids say, no, you can't do that. Why can't you? Of course you can. In fact, if it's a good person, what are they going to do? We understand there's bad people out there. There's bad people, it's okay. But if they don't know that they can use their voice, what are they gonna sit and do? They're gonna sit and watch the perpetrator. They're gonna watch that mean person, watch them, and do, their, do whatever they wanna do. But I can tell you, bad people, they don't like attention. Because attention, it, what it brings is witnesses. Witnesses bring convictions. And convictions mean bad guy goes to jail. They don't wanna go to jail. So we tell the kids, use your voice, let them know. Because a bad person, what are they gonna do? They're gonna hide their face, they're gonna run away. Just like when Brittany Baxter hit scratch for four seconds, he ran away. He ran away. Brittany Baxter did the next thing that is most important, tell. She reported it right away. She reported it right away. She told, told and telling it right away is most important because you have the most vivid of the memory, the most vivid of your thoughts, and so we can get a good description and we can go find that person. And he was taken into custody and now he's back where he needs to be, in prison. Now, like I said, as, as the kids get older, we start to see that they get more freedoms. Middle schoolers, they go to the mall. We, tell, we teach them techniques at the middle school, but you can talk to your kids. If you come up with an idea, like even talk to your kids about how can you draw attention to yourself in a mall? 
my, my uh, now graduate, she had my classes in, in sixth and seventh grade on self-defense and how to, how to protect yourself. And she said, Dad, you remember how you said, use your voice as a weapon and make sure and draw attention? And we were in the mall at Independence Center at Christmas time. Anybody know how busy that is? <laughs> yeah. And as we're walking, oh, is that your money right here? Is that yours? Whose money is this? Somebody dropped $10? She said, Dad, watch this. You look, don't you? When there's money involved, we look. People look. They want to see bad people don't like attention. She said, Dad, if there was somebody behind me and making me feel uncomfortable, do you know what I would do? And she yelled, don't let your kids do this. If you have a middle schooler, be careful at the mall, because I, I tell them to try this with their parents at the mall. She yells down, is this somebody's $100 bill? Do you think anybody's going to look at a $100 bill? And I'm, <laughs> come on, honey, it's time to go. Bad people do not like attention. We, we teach the, the, those techniques. We teach them different ideas. As parents, we should be coming up with those ideas. As simple as, if you're home alone and you answer the phone, what do every kid say when somebody asks, are you home alone? Either they say, because they're not thinking about they're not prepared, yes, I'm home alone. No, my parents are not here. Or where are their parents? Where are they? In the shower. How many of you guys thought in the shower? Everybody, every time the kids think in the shower. So we teach them. You have to be mentally prepared. And if you're not talking to your kids about being mentally prepared, that's exactly what they're going to say. They're going to say, no, they're not here, or they're in the shower. We talk to our kids at the middle school, and we tell them, why don't you come up with something different like, yeah, my mom's home, but she's upstairs washing the dogs. We have a Rottweiler and a German Shepherd, and so it's going to take a few minutes. Oh, oh, one of them just bit mom. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit longer. Can I get your name and number, and I'll have her give you a call? We might have to go to the hospital on this one. Do we have a dog? Yeah, we have a little Yorkie. But is it okay to lie to somebody? We have to teach our kids that if, if you're in a circumstance that you have fear, it's okay to not tell the truth to make sure that you're okay. Like I said, mo most important thing of all is talking to your children, having the open lines of communication to not be fearful because liberty is a great community, but there are bad things. And they have, if they're not mindful, then they can find themselves in danger. The last thing I wanted to point out in the stranger danger because of technology, we have kids that, if, if your kids are walking to school alone, if they have a cell phone, it's a great idea. Don't be afraid of your child having a cell phone. What a great device. What a great device to have. Well, actually, I put it away for a moment. What a great device to have if there's a stranger. Because I can tell you, my seventh grade daughter takes a thousand pictures of herself every day. A thousand <laughs> selfies. And I don't know how a seventh grade can do this, but a, a thousand selfies with a thousand different faces. I don't know how it's done, but they can do it. And they're quick about it. Wow, I have a witness. Why not have that phone out? I asked the kids. Have your phone. If you have a phone, have it out when you're walking, especially if you're alone. We, even in Liberty, we encourage walking in groups, staying in groups. Groups have defense. Bad guys do not like witnesses. When you have a group, you have witnesses. But if you don't, make sure if you have your phone, have it out. Now, I tell the kids, this doesn't mean go and tell mom and dad that you have a cell phone, that you need one, that you have to have one. But if you do have one, have them out and ready. Take a quick snapshot. This is the person that tried to give me a piece of candy. This is the person that wanted me to help them find their dog. This is the car. We got a picture of it. I asked the kids, some of the kids tell me, well, <laughs> Officer Hamline, I pretend like I'm talking on the phone so people will leave me alone. Do we care if they actually make a call? Encourage your kid. If they're feeling uncomfortable, it's okay to call. Use the phone. Don't be sitting there texting because this is the worst thing is texting because you're not aware of your surroundings. And bad guys love it. They used to have, to have to hide behind trees. They don't have to hide behind trees anymore. They just wait for the kid and their cell phone. Because they're not going to wait. They don't have to hide anymore. They can just wait for them to come into their arms. Tell your kids. Put it, have it available, but be alert and aware of your surroundings. And use it. Don't fake it. Go ahead and call. Call home. Call your friend. I'm on my way to your house. Is it okay that I talk to you? Is it okay if I talk on the way there? Are they going to care? Of course not. Talk to your children and communicate. That was the first thing I was asked to talk about is stranger danger. I'm going to go a little bit quicker through this. The next thing I was asked to talk about, although I do feel that it's probably the most important lesson that I do teach, and that's the life lessons at the, at the middle school level. In sixth grade, we teach every sixth grade in Liberty Public Schools the life lessons. 
Liberty Intervention focusing on education. And I truly feel that these lessons, we, we got away from D.A.R.E. about eight to nine years ago because D.A.R.E. is a program to teach a kid to say no to drugs, say no to, to, to bullying, say no to gangs, say no, say no. If you tell a kid to say no, do not touch the stove, what are they going to do? They're going to touch the stove. If you tell a kid, no, don't touch drugs, what are they going to do? It's just like the stove. So what we learned is we feel that it's more confident more and better for them to have an education on why not to do things because they're going to have to make the choice. You're not going to be there. I'm not going to be there when their friends are sitting next to them saying, hey, do you want to smoke some marijuana? Do you want to drink some alcohol? Do you want to try a cigarette? I'm usually not standing there. It's, it doesn't happen. So we give them ed education so that they can make a choice, an educated choice on what is best for their future. Now we encourage say no to drugs. We hope they say no to drugs and we will deal with them if they do say yes. But the life lessons are there to teach them it's about choices and that's what life is about. The choices we make, they have consequences. They have good consequences, they have bad consequences. And the life lessons are there to help them so that they can make their choice. I put together a little a presentation, <laughs> PowerPoint presentation to go over each of the lessons that we, we do uh, give to each child each sixth grader in the in the program the very first lesson obviously sixth graders and seventh graders their bodies are changing and their minds are changing and so i was asked to make this one the very first lesson as they come in to the to the middle school level sexual harassment because it is natural and it's okay for it to, for them to have the thoughts and the ideas but we have to make sure that the school is a educational system it's a learning place not a place that you can do inappropriate things so we teach them sexual harassment in, at the school and outside of school. What is a good touch? What is a bad touch? We talk to them generically just so that they, and all of our life lessons are, so that they go home and talk to their parents about the lessons that we teach. Now we know some of the parents don't talk to them, so we, we encourage them. Go talk to a counselor, come talk to me, talk to an administrator, talk to a teacher if you have more questions. But we keep them pretty generic on what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. They actually get to have a little exercise where they get to actually get to feel a little bit about what sexual harassment feels like. We start off a little bit separated and they move closer and closer. And they're challenged to get as close as they can. And as you can see, some of them get pretty close before they get that gut feeling that this is nasty, I can't handle it anymore. And they're taught, they're, 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 they're told to stop when they feel the most uncomfortable and we explain to them that's what it feels like for somebody that's sexually harassed. Then we separate them, that gut feeling goes away, that nastiness goes away, but we explain to them then that a sexual harassment, in sexual harassment with somebody sexually harassed, that feeling doesn't go away and a lot of them get it. In fact, our counselors, they hate this part, this lesson. They do not like this lesson with us and the reason why, because they start realizing, wow, I was sexually harassed, I was bothered, I was. I was said, something was said to me inappropriately, and they start reporting, which we handle, but it just means a lot more, a lot more reports, and we take care of those, those situations. We then get into internet safety. We have a few lessons in internet safety, cybersecurity. Even though our school computers are protected, and we update our protection on our school computers, home computers, they are susceptible to viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and well, we're finding in law enforcement that our kids are actually victims of identity theft because they don't find out that somebody's taken their identity until they apply for credit. And when do they get to apply for credit? When they're 18 years old. So we have to make sure our kids realize, do not place that personal information, your social security number, your birthday, your address, your, those inf that information online because those people out there that want to steal your identity will get it and you won't know about it until you're applying for it yourself. We talk about intellectual property and the powers and responsibility with the internet. The internet is an amazing thing. I have seen it firsthand. I have seen at Heritage Middle School, the kids in one night through social media have everybody pretty much wearing the same colors. And they did it every day for a week. They changed the color every day of the week. Social media is a powerful thing, but they have to respect it. They have to be responsible with it. Intellectual property, we actually talk about the illegal downloads and how it is a crime and it is taken away from our society. We are blessed to have a society where we have the freedom of speech and being able to 
show our thoughts and our ideas. And we encourage it. We want it. But those people that share those thoughts and ideas deserve to be compensated for it. Because if they're not compensated for it, they're not going to show us. They're not going to share with us those thoughts and ideas. So we encourage them. If you're going to download something, make sure and pay for it. And we actually do a public service announcement so that they can share with everybody else. Why not to steal intellectual property? We do have a lesson on cyberbullying. And this is a lesson where we, we teach them the different, different types of cyberbullyers. And we actually teach them, that, and some of them actually realize, I didn't realize I was a cyberbullier, Officer Hamline. I inadvertently teased somebody on a video game. I inadvertently said something about somebody's picture. I inadvertently, I didn't mean to. Then we also have those that actually do mean to, to be mean on, on the internet. And we talk about the repercussions, the consequences, but we also talk about the good things, the powers that when you are reporting that somebody is cyberbullying, when you help somebody that's being cyberbullied, because we go back to that sexual harassment class, that gut feeling, and we talk about how could you feel if you came to school and somebody cyberbullied you at, at home? The students actually see Instagram. They see the, it, Twitter. They see the cyberbullying, and they are reporting it to us. And we take action and help them get through it. We do talk about predators. What we have found, though, in law enforcement is that the predators typically aren't somebody, a stranger, in a faraway land. They're not somebody far away. It's somebody right in our community. What we're finding is somebody that has to communicate with you. Somebody that wants to communicate with you. Some, it might be a high school student. It might be somebody in college. It might be somebody just in our community that has a friend link that gets in touch with you. So we talk to them about predators. And yes, there are some that will find you online because you posted the wrong name. You posted the wrong picture. But they have to communicate with you to find you. Mean, bad people typically are mean and bad and violent because they can't communicate. What we're finding is that the ones that are, are predators typically aren't the people that are in faraway places. There's somebody that's going to communicate with you. And we tell them that when you're, when you're online, as you can see in the bottom, bottom screen there, how do you feel when somebody flirts with you online? You never know who you're talking to. Even if it is your friend's web page, even if it is their Facebook, is somebody else linked into them? Does somebody else get their password? And so they start to get an eye opening that, hey, the person on the other side might be next door, and they might be on the other side of town, they may be on the other side of the world, but we don't know who that person is. After the internet safety, we get into drug talks. We start talking about drugs. Now our drug, our, our lessons, we, we veered away from D.A.R.E. D.A.R.E. was the just say no to drugs. Actually, D.A.R.E. has now transformed, and they are coming to a science-based drug education also. Our science-based drug, drug education, our program, was actually prepared by Lieutenant Ed Moses. Of the, he's retired from the Missouri Highway Patrol. He worked undercover narcotics, and has, he's a major influence in the, report, in, in the education of drugs all across the United States. And Dr. Duncan, he's out of the University of Oklahoma. They, he's um, a, um, not a neurologist, but he works with the brain and uh, psychological in the, at the University of Oklahoma. They came together and they put this program together that we actually were given and we were able to, we're able to update it, we're able to change it. We, uh, every SRO that both of us that teach it now, we had to go through a, a week-long course with them over every aspect of the lesson and they both actually come and teach the lesson to us so that we're meant, we are prepared to teach the children, the, the, the kids, the facts of the science-based education. And it is, it's, it's a lot more than what I first thought. In fact, we had three days of just learning about the brain. Because to understand drugs, you have to understand the brain. Because the brain is the, what's infected, affected most about the, uh, uh, with drugs. In fact, Dr. Tucker, he came to our, our uh, life celebration here a couple of weeks ago, and he learned the, the, the phrase and wants to know a little bit more about neuroadaptation. It's funny that we have a coffee talk here because I talk to the kids. Neuroadaptation is the process, is when the neurons in the brain actually start to rewire themselves. And when you put a drug into your system, those neurons, they rewire themselves and they crave it. They want it. You get addicted to it. And so I ask them, do you and your, any of your parents ever go through neuroadaptation? Are they addicted to coffee? That's what coffee does. It changes the neurons in our brain. Our brain gets accustomed to it. They want it. And then when we don't have it, our neurons are telling us, where is the caffeine? 
and we get the headaches, we get the moods. It's changed our brain. Harsher drugs are illegal because they cause neuroadaptation a lot faster, a lot easier. So we break down the brain. We talk about the brain. Then we talk about the different drug categories and how they actually affect the brain. How depressants, they slow down the neurons. They'll make the neurons go to sleep. Stimulants, they'll speed up the neurons. They make them go faster, make you feel like your body's going faster, but it's just your brain going faster. And hallucinogens, they distort the senses. They'll send messages from the senses into different part, the wrong parts of the brain until so you'll have a different sensory. We talked about the gateway drugs. What we're, we are actually going to revamp this one for next year because what we're finding out and talking with the kids at school is gateway drugs are typically tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana are the first leading drugs because they figure out they all have access to them. Two of them are legal in our society. One of them they're trying to make legal in our society, but it grows wild anyway. So they, have, they can get to any of those three drugs in the city of Liberty. It's prevalent. So we talked to them about the gateway drugs. It's not that... The, the, those that use alcohol and tobacco are dangerous, but it, as a young age especially, what it leads to is what's dangerous. Alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, they lead to other drugs because it breaks down those inhibitions, it breaks down your barriers, and so you move on to other drugs. And we talk about those other drugs, marijuana and, and methamphetamines. Even though we don't have as big of an issue in the Liberty area, with methamphetamines, we talk about not just methamphetamines, but we, we talk about synthetic drugs, man-made drugs, and so they have an understanding because we do have students, we do have students in the Liberty area that do have addictions to these type of drugs. We're thankful that we don't have very many, but it is, it is in our community, so we want them to be aware. We talk to them mostly about marijuana because it is in our society. It's something they're gonna to have to vote for maybe, whether or not to legalize it in Missouri. In fact, we actually have an essay contest because we explained to them, there are groups in our state that want to legalize marijuana. Most of our students are totally 100% opposed to it. 99% of them are totally 100% opposed to it at the sixth grade level. In fact, after we give them the education that people try to, they try to normalize it. They try to make you feel like it's okay for medicine. They, they make you feel like it's okay for, for lip balm. In fact, the sixth grade student, after giving this lesson, she went to her locker and she brought her lip balm to me. And she said, Officer Hamline, there's a marijuana leaf on the lip balm if you can't see it. She said, does this have THC in it? She didn't realize that there's no drugs in there. But she thinks that marijuana was fine for her lips. Are there better lip balms for us? Absolutely. Aloe is usually, and it has a healing effect. Do we need hemp oil in it? We talk to them about that, but we give them the knowledge so that they can make the choice. And we hope that the choice is that it is no. They actually write letters and we actually had some really incredible essays. We, I have a stack of over 400 essays ready for the legislators in Missouri so that if, if it does come to a vote, if it goes to the floor, we're going to invite those with the best essays to go along with us if they want to go and read their essays and we're going to present give those essays to our legislators so that they can see from the minds of those that are most important to us those middle schoolers the young the youth of our society what that really means to them so they they can really tell just to share real quickly if it's okay if i'm not going too long is that all right one of them one of them a young lady she actually read it read the essay to her whole sixth grade class she was a she was the victim of of drugs her mo her biological mother had a problem couldn't take her, couldn't keep her, and so she ended up being adopted, and she has risen above and beyond, and she's one of the best students at Liberty, at Liberty Middle School that I've ever had the pleasure of working with, and she wrote this great essay about her, her why we should not legalize marijuana. At the, end of, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the life lessons, we have a graduation, and it was pretty neat because it's probably the most important part of the education because it's a reinforcement. We're blessed to have great support. We had Dr. Tucker, we had the mayor, we had the chief of police, we had the fire chief, we have city councilmen, we have our school board members, all of our principals, our teachers, they all get a t-shirt and they all dress up and they all get to shake those important people's hands, showing the support that th their choices do have an impact, not just on themselves, but also on the future of our community here in Liberty. That's why I truly feel that the life lessons are that important and that we should con always continue teaching these kids to make the choices that are best for them, but give them the education that they need so that they can have the capability of making that right choice. And that starts off with parents talking to your kids, 
about anything, everything. Because if you don't talk to them about anything and everything, those kids at school, they will. I think this brings our portion of the program to a close. As we mentioned, you've seen a slice of what we do in Liberty Public Schools. Um, and certainly the lives of children today are more complex than ever before. And so as we put our arms around children, it really is the point that our community takes that initiative. Uh, whether it's the police department and the work that they do with our district in providing the life program, whether it's the support of our city and officials and city leaders, whether it's parents developing that line of communication one with another with their children. Um, that's really where it lands. One of the things that Officer Heim Heimline shared was the importance of relationship. And what you're not seeing in the presentation this morning is the ongoing connections that are made from classroom teachers to children, from counselors to students, parents in talking and having conversations with kids. Um, so we look forward to continuing the conversation around the myriad of issues uh, that children face in, in our society and continue those efforts. We do want to open it up uh, for you all if there's questions that you may have of Officer Hamline or myself. Um, any questions from the group? As we mentioned, uh, we will continue our efforts with the Liberty Alliance for Youth and continue to seek opportunities to engage and identify solutions on the myriad of things that we face and that our children face. Thank you again. Appreciate Mr. Ackerman and his efforts and his staff in putting this event together. Hope you have a great rest of this week and a great spring.